Hello, everyone. My name is Jen Lansford. I'm the director of the Center for Child and Family Policy here at Duke, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to um, the Salzburger Distinguished Lecture today. Thank you all for being here. So the, Sol the Center for Child and Family Policy sponsors the Salzburger Distinguished Lec Lecture Series to stimulate the intellectual community, not only um, our own faculty and research scientists and staff, um, but also the Duke community more broadly. And now, thanks to our Zoom option, um, people around the country and world. So the Salzburger Speaker Series brings prominent researchers to campus um, to share their experiences on topics and issues impacting children and families' well-being. These lectures are made possible through an endowment from the Arthur Salzberger family, and I would like to thank Cynthia Salzberger and Stephen Green in particular for their support, and they're um, joining us today by Zoom. So speaking of technology, now is a great time to remind you to turn off your phones or silence your phones. So thank you for doing that. And today we're very fortunate to have Dr. Vilma McBride-Murray as our guest speaker. Dr. McBride-Murray is Associate Provost in the Office of Research and Innovation at Vanderbilt University and holds the Lois Autry Betts Endowed Chair. She's a university distinguished professor in departments of health policy and human and organizational development. Dr. McBride-Murray is the past president of the Society for Research on Adolescence and incoming president of the International Consortium on Developmental Science Society. She was one of the 100 elected members of the 2020 class of the National Academy of Medicine and was recently appointed to the National Institutes of Health National Advisory Mental Health Research Council. Her research examines the significance of context to everyday life experiences of African-American families and youth, focusing on processes through which racism and other social structural stress stressors cascade through families to influence parenting and family functioning, developmental outcomes, and adjustment among youth during critical developmental periods from childhood through young adulthood. Uh, Dr. McBride Murray presents intervening to present and reduce behavioral health disparities, and it's a true pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lansford. I'm delighted to be here. I see Ken Dodge is in the, in the audience, along with my wonderful sister friend, uh, Lynn Vernon Fagan. Lynn and I go way back. Uh, we see each other less often now than we used to when we were on the international board. But I'm really delighted to be here. I was just thinking about uh, the last time I was here. And it's been a while. Uh, it's been a while for all of us because we were sheltered down because of something that decided to take charge of the entire world. But I want to also thank the, the Salzberger family for this great opportunity to do this and want to pay a tribute to Erica, uh, who has done a phenomenal job uh, getting things organized. And I said to her, she had things so organized, it was just like just walking down a hallway because I just knew exactly what to do. So I'm really, really delighted to be here. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I'm a Mac user, so I should probably not use this thing. And uh, I will just use these buttons. How about that? Okay. <laughs> uh, and so I want to say that I don't have anything to disclose, uh, just so that you'll know that I'm not, I'm, I'm not disclosing anything because I have no financial interest in what I'm going to be sharing with you today. So as a true teacher, we start out by telling people what we're going to talk about and then talk about it. And then the question is, did you really tell us what, it, what you said you were going to talk to us about? So, these are the big topics that I'm going to discuss today, and one is giving a really brief overview of the behavioral crisis that's happening among Black and African American youth, and then I'll offer some explanations, theoretical explanations of what people say or the reasons why these behavioral disparities are occurring, looking then at a model of behavioral health services in order to examine uh, help seeking behaviors of rural uh, African American mothers when they have actually been informed that their child has a behavioral problem, and more importantly, that the diagnosis indicates that they really do have a clinically diagnosed problem, and then what do they do? Then addressing health disparities through a family centered preventive intervention program, 
And then I'll talk about lessons learned for scaling of services in primary care settings as a place where families have access to trusted individuals that can prescribe these things for families to begin to assist them in taking care of their children. And then lastly, I've really begun to think a lot about even my own work and how important it is for us to begin to look at upstream system level factors and processes that perpetuate the kind of problems that people experience as they're trying to raise a healthy children. So when we look at the current state of the behavioral situation for uh, African-American youth, statistics will show us that suicide rate has increased to its highest ever. Some statistics say by 500%. But what we do know is that it's one of the second leading causes of death among Black and African-American youth during critical developmental ages and stages when they should be preparing to enjoy the remainder of their life. The death rate for suicide for Black or African-American men is four times higher than African-American women, the data from 2018. And then Black girls or Black females raised 9 through 12 were 60% more likely to attempt suicide compared to their non-Hispanic white female of the same age. And over the last decade, suicide rates among kids very young, 10 to 14, increased 233% compared to 120% for non-Hispanic whites. So something is happening to these young people. And the question is, why is it because it's taking away many lives? My colleague, Sean Joe, would suggest that even the homicide rates that we see among young people is really intentional harm. So they, they place themselves in harm's way as a way of ending their life. And when you look at across the board in terms of African-American uh, uh, chronic diseases at early ages, you can see the onset of chronic diseases happening much earlier among African-American youth, such that we're seeing signs of high blood pressure, diabetes, and strokes, even at a very young age. And you begin to look at reasons why they think these patterns are happening. And for many individuals, they say that it's the social factors that affect their health. So they look at things like unemployment, the stress associated with living in poverty, no home ownership. Uh, blacks are less likely to own homes. And I remember when we were launching a study in Georgia, in Hancock County, and met with some of the community people, and they informed us that the, the loan agencies only allow people that have historical enslavement history to Hancock County to purchase brick homes. Everyone else has to get mobile homes. And so if you go through rural communities and you see high concentrations of mobile homes, then the question is how much of that has to do with the structure that's set in place that prevents people from being able to own these homes. And then you look at couldn't find or have access to physicians, and then those things that we think are individual factors that all time are results of managing stress, smoking, eating patterns, feeling too low and depressed to be physically active. This is a study from one of my colleagues uh, at the University of Georgia is the family and community health study that we've been a part of since the early 90s. Well, what they were showing is that you can actually trace the early stages of aging among the sample of Black, middle-aged, and young adults. And that neighborhood has a lot to do with the extent to which people are healthy. But we've heard this over and over again, that where you live in your zip code has a lot to do with how well your health is. And so what they they show is that a standard deviation increase in neighborhood disadvantage was decrease one's life by a half year. Just one standard deviation from a neighborhood where other people were living decreased people's lives by one, a half a year. And that it was independently associated with the onset of chronic disease that they saw in this population. So not only is it decreasing life, but it's decreasing life as a consequence of early onset of aging, uh, where we have shown in, these, in this particular study 
Another study that Gene Brody published actually showed that the kids that were doing extremely well, they did everything right. They finished high school. They stayed away from drugs. They didn't get pregnant. They got jobs. But by the time they were age 24, they saw something happen to their genetic allele such that these kids that were doing well were actually showing early signs of chronic disease. And the question was, what's different about them? And what, they, what we found in this particular study, kids that had been exposed to high levels of racial discrimination and had suppressed it or sucked it up and navigated through it were actually manifesting problems that were not physically available to them to see until they got to that age when they began to see the signs of it. So the explanation for this, and I was looking at this the other day, actually, I used this model in a, in a class on Monday, uh, where we were talking about uh, in a public health course, but there are several explanations of why these disparities exist. And if you look at this work, this is Dressler's work that happened in 1993, and a lot of the theoretical explanations aren't, any, aren't much different than what we see now. And one attributes it to, there's something about this race that genetically increases the inclination that they have greater proneness toward the propensity for poor health, and that it has a lot to do with who you are, the phenotypic characteristics. The other one looks more at the individual behavior of the, of the person, saying that you are less healthy because you engage in unhealthy habits. So it's really your lifestyle that attributes to that. And so there are some people that will look at these numbers that I've seen, shown you earlier about chronic disease, and they immediately point to the fact that it must be something that the individual is doing. The other one says it's something about social class, in that there's some there's a there's a confound between SES and people's education and ethnic membership, such that if you are poor and black, you're more likely to have unhealthy behaviors. And so it has a lot to do with your SES. But when we look at maternal health and the death of black women and low birth weight, even those that are affluent are more likely to have low birth weight and problems with early death as a consequence of maternal health. So it must not be SES. Then there is this notion that maybe it's structural and social. So maybe it's something that has to do with the social environment that people are exposed to, and that it's not genetic, that it's not based on your phenotypic characteristics, but it has a lot to do with the social construction of the environment where individuals are required to live such that it, it has this taxation on their body that oftentimes start with their psychological functioning and spills over then to their actual physical health. And so we sought to, to explain this phenomenon in this model that you see here in a paper that we published in 2018, where we really said that if you're going to look at how Black families are managing stress, you cannot forget about the historical context by which they and their ancestors navigated through this environment to be where they are now. And that the historical vestiges of enslavement and Jim Crow laws situated these structural systemic situations that families are currently experiencing. And yet it happened over 350 or 400 years ago, but its vestiges are still with us. And they are demonstrated in the following way. The way that people continue to experience racism, discrimination, oppression, marginalization, and othering. The fact that we have these social positions that oftentimes place you in places and spaces just because of the way that you look. I was telling someone the other day when I started my faculty position at the University of Connecticut many years ago, what I noticed is that if I sat in the audience, before the class started, the students would start talking about the person that they heard was teaching the class. So they gave me a little bit of an idea of what they expected. Um, but not only that, it was the way in which they talked about the person that they had heard about teaching the class. And then when I would get up and they would see that this was a Black person, they just starkly surprised because they decided that evidently the wonderful evaluations that the people were talking about for this course, I couldn't have been me. And, and I, so I could see the surprises on their face, but the mere fact that our social position is all time based on these phenotypic characteristics 
such that people have, as Cynthia Garfield's poem would suggest, this idea of where your position is in society as a consequence of who you are as a member of that society. So what we then decided to do was, then it's important then to look at, as Grace Peters and Massey um, mentioned to us many years ago, Marie Peters, that it creates these mundane hassle that people have to experience over the course of their life. That your life gets crazy as a consequence of these social positions and the discrimination. And so all of these things that are listed here, we now call them social determinants of health. But they really are things that these young, these scholars in the 1980s at the University of Connecticut developed this notion of mundane extreme environmental stress as they were looking at ways in which families at the University of Connecticut and a community who were black were navigating living in this New England village. So then when these things happen, it has a sense of changing what is inhibited in terms of your vulnerability. But also, you'll see that I talk about them as promotive processes as well, as the way that families get through and navigate these difficult circumstances. So I borrowed from the work of, of uh, Ann Matson, who talks about this notion of ordinary magic. And if anyone watched, there was a, 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 a BET show or something where this person said, it's not magic. It's just the way that we are able to get through life. And so I've begun to think, rethink that. But what I have here is ordinary magic, and it's these processes that they use in order to be able to navigate these mundane environmental stressors. And when they're able to navigate these mundane stressors, they're then able to have healthy relationships. They're able to raise healthy kids. Their biological processes aren't compromised, and their physiological and psychological more emotional well-being is further enhanced as a consequence of what they're doing, drawing on their cultural assets to navigate the circumstances. When that happens then, you see positive developmental outcomes in families. So it's going back to dress the dreadful social, structural, systemic process to illustrate ways in which it navigates through these families to influence the way in which they navigate their lives. This is a, so I've been talking about this rubber suits uh, when we had to have protective gear during COVID-19, I was saying, well, Black families suit up every day. Uh, and I called it family protective properties or protective gear. And as I kept talking about in the lab, my postdoc said, well, let me find you this rubber suit. And to illustrate what this rubber, how these families are wearing these rubber suits. And so Juliette Nyamba said, the kinship is what you put on your back as your support system. And so it's a backpack out there. That you look at optimism as a way of reframing, reframing your life so that you're able to navigate. But these are things you're wearing in your rubber suit. And that you look at your community organization as a way of centering yourself to someone much larger than you, to connect yourself to a much larger system. And that is the racial pride and racial socialization that help you stay afloat, help you walk this and that, this pathway. And then spirituality is what you put under your, yourself to be able to navigate. But so I want to pay tribute to her as, um, because it really was her way of really beginning to illustrate what I talk about a lot in give, putting on rubber suits to swim in toxic waters. And the toxic waters are the waters that I mentioned earlier, that are really resulting as a consequence of the systems that have been developed to create oppression. So what's the implication of this then for behavioral health? Well, we think it has a lot to do with health-seeking behavior. And a lot of the health-seeking behaviors has to do with the fact that who is specializing in the work that you, in your health, such that when you go and see someone, you don't have to culturally educate them in order to understand what your life experiences were like. So there are few people specialize in these particular issues. There's a tendency for Black people to minimize when they aren't feeling well psychologically, saying, I'm just blue or I'm just low, or my mom went through these same phases. And so the minimalization of it reduces the likelihood that, then they, that they're going to seek help. And then the perception that if you do say that you are not feeling well or depressed, 
that it legitimates a sign of weakness. And particularly for women who are responsible for taking care of themselves and the village in which they live and the whole social stigma associated with what it means to be mentally ill, saying that a person must be crazy. Then there is communal stigma about putting your business out in the street. When you go to therapeutic sessions, you've got to talk about a lot of things. And a lot of things is very painful. And the question is, do you want to share that? And even more importantly, we'll find out, I don't want to overstep my story because it's one of the things that we found. If it's a cousin who sees you going into this place and they tell somebody else, and it's a place where mental health seeking behaviors occur, it's a barrier. There's a reluctance then to seek professional care with a greater reliance on their trusted messenger, which oftentimes is their pastor and their friends and their relatives. And I tell people we had in our family, Aunt Pauline, and Aunt Pauline had herself designated as a family physician for mental health and anything else. And so whenever family members weren't feeling well, you call Aunt Pauline, and if Aunt Pauline said, it sounds like, <laughs> then you're going to go and seek care. So this notion of relying on families in order to be able to get some relief for what you're going through, then things go untreated also because of the suspicion of the stories that they may not be able to tell you specifically, but everybody can tell you that they know Black people during the course of this history have been exploited in lots of ways, including the wonderful Clairol hair products. So then the perceptions of research clinical trials and mental health service delivery also is a barrier. There's a great concern about the ethics of clinical science. And the reason why it's difficult getting Black people to sign up for clinical trials one, they think you're going to be experimented on, and they're just suspicious of what it is that you want. So the vaccine hesitancy never moved a needle until they began to partner with the community of trusted messengers that said it's okay to do this because of the suspicion. Suspicion of research scientists. So when we go out in communities, we don't call our project research studies. We call them projects or programs because to use the research, it's a put off. And they told us that. Don't call it a research project. Believe that they're going to be experimented on without their consent. And suspicion of how the data will, go, will be used. Is it going to benefit the researcher? Or are you doing research for the purposes of benefiting the community? And why is my community being targeted in whatever it is that you're going to do? So unless we have valid responses and answers, more than likely, you aren't going to get the kind of participation that you would like for your study. So I'm going to share with you several studies that we've done, but the big message is trying to understand how do we begin to address behavioral health and the role that we can do as researchers in that process. And one of the ways that we do our preventive intervention work is first, find out what we know from the empirical research that can then help us identify malleable targets that we can focus on in preventive intervention. So my colleague at Vanderbilt University came to the University of Georgia when I was there, and she wanted to know about how do rural Black families think about mental health? And then how does that influence what they do when there's a need for mental health? And at the time that she came, we had this 13-wave study or study that we had 13 years following uh, single moms uh, at the University of Georgia. And she wanted to look at the sample, specifically the kids in the sample that were diagnosed with having some major behavioral problems. So we looked at the qualitative data to find out what was happening with these families. And then she wanted to conduct a much more in-depth interview in order to get into the inside story about what was going on with these families. So this is what I'm going to share with you now. And it's a longitudinal study, as I mentioned earlier, it started in 1993. The kids were ages seven at the time that the study started. It was also a sibling study, because so we looked at seven kids that were seven and then their older sib. Uh, Brody was interested at the time in the co-parenting of kids in rural communities, and so that was part of this particular study. And so we have these specific purposes. We want to know about the prevalence of this problem. We wanted to determine if and how parents are seeking services and accessing mental health services for their children 
And then the pathway by which parents were finding out that their child was really having some behavioral problem, and then the barriers for their health-seeking behaviors, and then began to know critical opportunities that could have been intervened on had people been attuned to what was going on with these families. We use this particular model, this is a behavioral model, that illustrates the ways in which individual levels that are predisposing, enabling, and their needs come together with people to determine the extent to which they need a particular service and that they look at their individual needs based on the community and the service systems that are available to them. So this is a particular study that I'm going to uh, share with you now uh, that was published by my colleagues and I. So the first question is, what is the prevalent behavioral problem that were diagnosed in this particular sample? This is a full sample. Um, a kid that had been diagnosed. And so you can see that there's a summary of problems, ADHD, learning disability, depression, behavioral problems skyrocketed above all others, and then there were other problems that were just clumped together. And then we asked a set of questions. Have other individuals expressed concern about your child's emotional or behavioral problems? And you can see that it's, you know, 40 42% or 41% said yes. 59% said no, no one had expressed any concern. Now, these are kids that were diagnosed as having behavioral problems, but no one had told them except they did. So the ones that said school personnel told me was 60%, almost 60% of them. Then we asked them, are you worried about your child? Uh, now that you know that your child, had, are you worried about them? You can see that most of them were not at all. And Reasons for that is, in the qualitative study, because Uncle Joe did the same thing. That this, you know, this is not uncommon in terms of how Johnny is responding. And so not realizing the genetic connection between what Johnny is doing and Uncle Joe, they just assume that this is how, you know, the kid was behaving. And then we ask, are you willing to seek treatment for, and, uh, for your emotional behavior problem of your child? And you can see, looking at the full sample and the families that were interviewed, most of them were really willing. They were willing to seek treatment. But then we asked them, what about your child? That's the barrier. They weren't going, one, because the child was unwilling to go. And so while the parent was willing to take the child, the child was unwilling to go to therapy, which then led to problems. Then we said, for those that did seek services, where did you get, go to get your help for your child? You can see what from the chart, it was just the counselor, which was a, the ca a counselor that had been, they've been referred to, a doctor, which is really the pediatrician, and then you look at school, friends, social worker, family, and the church. That's where they went when they were referred to go. Now, the question is, what, where would you have preferred to go? Look at that. So a real shift in where they were sent compared to where they would have wanted to go. Family first, on Pauline, school counselor, but look at where the professionals are. Psychiatrist, social worker, psychologist. Pastor came after the school counselor. Then teacher and doctor. So it says something then about the delivery system when you're thinking about addressing issues of behavioral health for families that are reticent about going to professional services. But the referrals kept sending them to these professional places. Then the question should come in the mind of the clinician, how compliant were they? How much did they adhere to the treatment? Because that's not where they wanted to be. Then we begin to dive much further into what might be explaining what was happening. And so we, the notion that there is a sense of mistrust is very common in the literature. So we ask the question about, do you feel that, do you feel that you can trust your professional no matter what the race is? Which was a general question about mistrust. And I am suspicious that white professionals will not treat my child as well as they would treat a white child was the second question. So the second question focuses on culture. Or, or racism, and then the other one focused on general. And you can see that there's very little difference between the full sample and then the women that we interviewed uh, to find out more qualitatively 
what was going on. But what we do know is that it does matter in terms of feeling, one, I don't feel that I can trust professional no matter what the race, almost 80%. I believe that white clinicians would treat my child differently. You can see where that is as well. So that's a real critical issue in terms of this trust uh, of system. Then we ask them about the stigma. This is if you go into a clinic and your cousin is there and you walk back out and pretend that you're in the wrong place. I would be afraid of what people would say about me as a parent if my child had to go to professional health, which is something else to know, is that the sense of if my child is having ADHD, learning disability, other problems, I haven't done a good job as a parent. Rather than looking at it as a diagnosable behavioral health issue. And so owning that is a barrier to them seeking behavior. And about 60% of the full sample agree, and about 50% or 55% in the other sample. So stigma is a critical issue. I, if I took my child to get help, my family would be very supportive. And you can see again, that matters, which is yes, they would be supportive. Again, family matters in terms of being able to address behavioral health issues as it relates to this particular sample. And so for the qualitative interview, these were face-to-face -face by trained people, and we asked these various questions. And, and, uh, and so what I want to do now is just tell you what they identified in terms of their child mental health needs. They acknowledged that the behaviors were seen at home or in the community. So they had observed them before it ever happened. And then we said, then who identified them outside of the outside of family? More often than not, it was school. The school counselor or teacher told them. Physicians and juvenile justice system. Pathways of finding out if your child had problems. And what we found is that for a significant number of these kids, the true diagnosis happened once they became part of the juvenile justice system, meaning a pathway to incarceration as a consequence of a behavioral problem that began when the child was very young. And so system level barriers to health seeking behaviors, most had used some type of mental health service. Most offered specific information about knowing where the services were, but only one of them mentioned insurance as a barrier to receiving, to, to a, a barrier for them receiving care. They began to then look at accessing the problems by obtaining information about what to do for their child's emotional problem. They said, we tried to find help and we asked what should we do, but we had difficulty traveling. And then we had conflict with our work schedule and when the clinics were available. Again, it's looking at system level processes that impede the opportunity to help children when they need it. The other thing that surprised us is that there were concerns about other things beyond the child's life. The fact that we don't have places for kids to go. And so when we're going into our these communities doing preventive intervention programs, they're wanting more than just coming in to tell them about a parenting program. And they will immediately ask you for that. And so the question is, how are we addressing other kinds of needs when we know that that's also one of the needs that is creating problems for families? They talked about affordable housing. Here comes the other aspects of the social determinants of health. They talked about financial assistance needing in order for, to be able to pursue the services. They talked about medical facilities not available in their homes. It's even worse now that we've had a major closing of rural hospitals throughout the state of Tennessee and probably lots of states as well, they needed food, food insecure. And people don't think about rural communities as being food deserts, but they are. So needing food bank and then wanting parenting classes are the things that they say would be helpful to them. So none of the parents directly said that reported directly seeking mental health services. None of them that the, the information was coming from either the school referring them or the doctors referring them. 
or finding out when their child was arrested for some behavior that their child was having behavioral problems. So one of the things that was very clear in all of this work is that families matter. This is what I'm saying. So they matter, and they just show, they just told us how much they matter. They are the most proximal fundamental system associated with not only the child, but also the family. And that our work has shown that family-based preventive interventions is the appropriate way to begin to address a sundry of problems. And that it's important when you're offering these programs that they're culturally tailored, because when they are, families are much more likely to uptake those things that you're sharing with them. And so I'm going to talk with you now about how we take research findings from a study like the one that I just shared with you, and then we translate them into preventive interventions, and then we test the extent of, to which the things that are supposed to work are working, and then we find out whether or not it's efficacious. Uh, and so today I'm going to highlight a uh, program that I launched when I moved to the uh, Vanderbilt University called Pathways for African American Success. Um, this program is an a e health delivery platform such that the, all of the program is delivered through avatars who are the program implementers, and then there are parents that look like avatars that are avatars, that interact with the human parents, and then there are youth that are avatars that interact with the youth. And so all of the information is received by the youth as they enter into this virtual space, uh, and they go through the program, and these are the things that we target. We target the way in which parents are parenting, we target these youth protective processes. So the parents really target these things that I call intervention targeted mediators. Our hope is that these mediators then would forecast low vulnerability on the things that are here in middle school with sustaining effect as they move into high school and young adulthood. The program is designed such that it is similar to the Strong African American Families Program. There's a parent session where these parents get onto a laptop computer, and they interact with Avatar's parents, and the kids have their own laptop computer, and they're interacting with Avatar kids, focusing on these particular kinds of processes. The intervention that is e-health takes about 45 minutes, but the setting up and all is about an hour. Um, and then once they leave their individual session, the kid finds the parents, and they get on the parents' computer and they go through a family session where the avatar youth have done the same thing. So AJ goes and finds his mother, Ms. Brown, and when they look at the family session, the avatar kid is with his or her parent like the human kid is with his or her parent. A three-off study, uh, self-directed technology or e-health condition, facilitated that condition, condition where there were Humans delivering the program to 10 or 12 families uh, in a session, similar kind of setup. And then we had home mailings that were delivered to the families during the same time that the families were going through these two active experimental conditions on the same material that they were exposed to. So we actually had three interventions, mail out, e-health, in person. And the question is, which of these mechanisms of delivering this program will events greater changes in the things that we targeted? In other words, does platform matter? And these are the findings. So the first finding we did, we looked at comparing these three randomized arms, and these families were randomized at the county level, such that in each county we selected across five counties, um, you know, 90 to 100 families that became part of the study. And so what I want you to do is pay attention to the arrows and welcome, so that is welcome um, Okay. Um, and so one of the things that I, so the first, the first comparison is looking at the e-health of the technology versus the control. And then the middle is looking at the group versus the control. And then the last one is the technology versus the uh, group. Because these are the two active groups on the side. The question is, are we finding different things on the things that we targeted? And if so, where are we finding the differences in what we're in what we targeted? So the first thing to note is that 
when you look at the technology versus the control group, where we saw greater changes was technology group reported higher changes in those parenting targeted behaviors. Articulating risk to your kids, expectations about risk behaviors, conversations that were supportive, and youth and the technology were more likely to not be intending to engage in risky behavior. It's an HIV risk reduction behavior, I mean, intervention. So we wanted to decrease onset and escalation of alcohol and, on, and onset of sexual activity. And the technology group, you can see that those kids reported less likelihood to do that. Then we looked at what's different about the group, in-person group, where the facilitators led the group versus the control group. You see that there's difference in same kind of parenting processes, except we added uh, frequency of conversation and discussion, quality discussions with the parents. And then we also see that kids reported that their parents had engaged in more conversations with them about risk behavior expectation, articulating their expectation. Then you look at then the technology versus the control, the, the uh, group condition, and the only change we saw was that for the technology group, the youth were less likely to engage in risky behavior. So what does that say? It says both programs work as it relates to parenting processes, except youth the technology program does a better job of dissuading risk-engaging behaviors among youth. Okay. The next study that I want to share with you, uh, and it's in prevention science, so I didn't have the final proofs, and so this is from my computer. Uh, but it was with my colleague, uh, Katie Burkle, and we asked a set of questions about looking at ways in which parents and kids' experiences of depression co-occur co co to affect each other and the way in which racial discrimination contributes to that. And then the last one is the mechanism by which parenting and racial pride serve as protective mechanisms to reduce the likelihood that racial discrimination will lead to mental health or behavioral problems. And so the first one is the risk process where we can see that parent exposure to discrimination increases depression, and when a parent's depression is positively predictive of kids' depression, and that parent's discrimination, however, is not linked to kids' depression, but it's the child's actual exposure to, to racism that predicts their uh, depression. Then the next question is, what does racial equity inform parenting do? This is racial socialization and preparing kids to be racialized or informed about discrimination at the same time of not internalizing those messages. And what we see from this, that the changes that we see from pre to post tests in parent equity informed parenting is really due to parents' exposure to the electronic version of this test or the e-health. So parents exposed to the e-health program reported greater changes in racial equity informed parenting than parents in the small group and racial equity informed parenting was linked to racial pride, a youth interpersonal protective process. Racial pride decreased depression. Even in the midst of discrimination, it held in terms of protecting these kids from succumbing to the experiences associated with uh, racial discrimination. So the takeaway message is as it relates to the usefulness of the past program in primary care settings is that healthcare settings are looking for ways in order to be able to address critical issues that their families are exposed to. There's limited amount of time that they can be in the, in the setting with the family. And many of them might benefit from knowing that there are evidence-based programs that they can actually prescribe for their parents in order to be able to protect them that are evidence-based, evidence-based. So there's a growing interest in embedding preventive intervention programs in healthcare services. Part of actually the Biden's administration and the Affordable Care Act focused on the importance of increasing the, light, the, the usefulness of behavioral health programs in primary care settings. So we're suggesting that this particular program 
offers promise for the, for the possibility of being able to have this as a program that's prescribed in, in clinical in a primary care setting. My colleague, uh, um, uh, Guillermo, I mean, uh, the policeman, my colleague in, in Miami already have begun to embed his program uh, in, in primary care setting, seeing great results. But we do know that it's a way that we can begin to customize a program that's culturally tailored for the families that you're serving. The engines that were done to build this particular program, you can plug in different languages and different groups of avatars in order to be able to expand the program in its delivery for audiences beyond the African-American uh, population. But what remains unknown is under what conditions do technology, is technology a viable platform to deliver these family-based preventive interventions programs? And more importantly, who's receptive to which form and how and why? So I'm gonna shift the gears as I come to the end of my talk. Because as I said earlier, I focused a lot on the resilience aspect of it. It's further talking about layering on your rubber suit. That's all I've talked about, how these families are putting their rubber suits on and they're navigating through these crazy situations. But I realize that the leverage of change is upstream. And we've got to begin to think about ways that we can elevate the work that we do to address system level changes. Keep talking about making families healthy to keep surviving, it's unconscionable for us to think about that. And I'm talking to myself, you know, this is me. It's my work, it's where I'm moving my work in terms of how I think I can begin to make a difference. So my colleagues and I just published this paper, uh, Re-Envisioning, Retooling, Rebuilding Prevention Science. And we call the charge act, the people that's doing preventive intervention, to begin to really think about how we do what we do, and the extent to how we're doing what we're doing isn't furthering a social justice equity lens. We aren't moving the needle. We don't ask questions about social determinants of health at baseline when we're doing many of our studies. We're asking demographic questions, but what do we do with that besides knowing who our people are rather than what are your needs? And so this is a paper we just had a a roundtable talk with 164 people uh, on the prevention methodology group of uh, Henry Brown last week. But what I want us to focus on really is looking at things up soon. Because where we are in the modeling is down here. We're looking at things that are down here at the individual level of impact. But the change happens way upstream. And George Howe, for anyone that knows him at George, George Washington University, his comment to the, to the group last week was, let's think more critically about meso system. We don't have to go all the way to our legislators. We can think about how do we begin to facilitate changes at the school system level? How do we make schools much more friendly, welcoming place? How do we create an opportunity for families to go into medical care services, social services, to get food stamps and not be treated as though you don't belong there? I mean, we can think about that at that medical community level. What's happening in the communities where these families are living such that we can begin to ask questions in our own research? Many of us do geo mapping. I mean, we go in communities and look at how far is the grocery store? What do we do with that information? We just publish it in our papers that nobody reads but us. And so that, you know, and so and, and then the other thing that I that I realized, and, and I'm I'm just becoming much more conscientious of that in the work that I do. So we published a paper called The Cascading Effect of Racism on Children from Middle Childhood to Young Adulthood. And many of the racial discriminatory experiences were happening in school. This is what these kids told us that was causing depression. The day that that paper was released, our governor decided to pull all these books, you know, like ban book stuff. He just had released this policy of why it is bad to have these books. 
in the classroom. And what I didn't do, which is what I should have done, was either call the local news station or write an op-ed or something, rather than saying, this guy is an underfield. Which I did say that. Oh, come on. Am I on the system? Oh, my. Yes, I do live in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, but, you know, I'm sitting there saying it was an opportunity for me to call this out with empirical research on over a thousand kids telling us what was happening to them and the toll it was taking on their parents to keep them encouraged to stay in school because of what they were experiencing in school. I mean, Sandra Graham has written a lot about this and a lot of other people. So that's where I am in, in the way that I'm thinking about my work. And so the practical approaches, I think we need to begin to look at system level change. We know that stigma and mistrust are ongoing concerns that gets in the way of a lot of the ways in which these families may be accessing or not accessing care. So how can we identify ways to eliminate this? Programs. Someone mentioned you have this teacher training program. How do we train our che teachers to become much more aware of the way in which they interact with these children or pushing them out rather than keeping them in? And being able to help parents become advocates for themselves. One of the sessions in this program is teaching parents how to advocate for your child when they have experienced unfair circumstances. They hear about it, they role play it, and then they begin to do it. When they And we teach the kids the same thing. And we just say, when things have been unfair, do you know how to go in and advocate for yourself such that you don't get yourself in trouble and go to detention? But schools are primary identifiers and referral agents, but they need to be family-friendly places. And I am going to end this because I want to keep it a talk. But, um, so I want to, these are the, so if we got rid of the rubber suits, all of these things, all the families there would be using their cultural assets to just raise healthy families. And they don't have to use them to swim and raise healthy families at the same time. Um, I want to thank my sponsors uh, for their support. I want to thank the Salzberger family, our families and communities that have invested in me because it, without them, I couldn't have not have done this work and even more for my research team. And by the way, I have students that are finishing if anybody needs folks to job. Um, I, I, so the, this is part of my research team and they're just an absolute delight to work with. And I feel extremely fortunate to be able to do uh, the work that I do. And I thank you. We have, we have time for questions. So thank you so much for that um, really meaningful and engaging talk. And we do have time for questions and discussion. So um, I welcome those. Please. So uh, stand up. So thinking, I love the phrasing of ordinary magic. I've been pushing against some of the black girl magic. Um, but I like the ordinary magic part. But you think that the perceptions of ordinary magic uh, keep people from both recommending services, so and then also keep, I, I, I can see how it can keep people from seeking services, but does it also keep people from recommending services because they can recognize, oh, they're involved in the church or you, know, you raise a very you raise a fabulous question, which I have not thought about, but it makes a lot of sense to me. Because one of the things that we know, uh, we have a study now looking at um, patients' perceptions of emergency care when patients pick up and the kind of care they get when they go into an emergency room. And at all times, they view it as being able to handle more pain. So I'm not going to give you the drugs that could numb this because I think you may actually be a drug addict. So that's the first image that they have. And so then after they realize that they, Really are in pain. I am a patient with sickle cell. Then they can. Then they say, "Well, you don't need this heavy of a dose because you can handle pain better." So these perceptions, it could be that family comes in and you realize that it's a child with a mother and a father and grandparents all around them, and this is you've got a strong system, so you'll be okay. So it could be. It could be that 
the notion of emphasizing the assets that people have could end up really getting in the way of the kind of services, not only that they may seek, but the referrals that they may not receive. So that's a fabulous, fabulous comment. Yeah. I know somebody has something. This was terrible, then why did you come here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, like, don't, don't have me, because I will talk again. <laughs> Thank you, first of all, I really uh, appreciated this. And I wonder, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is there's all this this research and other wonderful research that tells us what the problem is. But then, like you said, well, now we need to just do something about it. And the first thing that comes to mind is where do you get the money to do something like that? So do you have any advice for people who are maybe seeking grants or like that first step to try to access uh, a program like this? So one of the things that I know is there is this Increase awareness at NIH that equity matters. <laughs> so, you know, I've been part of several workshops where they've begun to talk about equity. I was part of the OMB's equity training for all the funding agencies for the federal government, where the president was saying, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Erica. Where the, where the president was saying, to the evaluate to, to all the funding agencies, NIH, CDC, and to identify ways to assess the utilization of evaluate equity in your in the funding that is being emitted from those agencies. So it is an area that people are beginning to look at. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation just had a call for system level action change proposal where they were looking for researchers that we're going to be working with systems, bringing the academic partners with systems to begin to think about how do you begin to aggregate your services such that system uh, reliant families aren't going all over the place in order to be able to get the kind of services that they need. And I work with this judge, juvenile justice judge in Davidson County. She is just incredible. Um, and when she, does, when, when young people come into her court, she immediately identifies a way to divert them from detention. She does everything she can to divert them from detention. And she has on staff people that work with Child Protective Services, DFACs, public health. She, they're part of her staff. And then they refer out. So they do the screening, they refer out, but when they refer out, they have to go to these places for services. And it's the, it's the, it's, it's the, it's creating a way that it removes the barriers. And so my question is, why can't we set up integrated, integrated care hubs? In community, we found that we could do this with, with COVID. We set up hubs. We set up places where people can easily go and get vaccinated and get screened and tested. Why can't we do this for other kinds of healthcare services rather than requiring them when they don't have transportation, which often is a problem, is that they don't have transportation or the money. And if you live in a city where gentrification has occurred, they've moved the families with greatest need way out, outside of the realms of the City, such that sometimes in Atlanta, off of the rail where public transportation is. And so, if you think about that, I'm calling out people. If you think about that, then, you know, so anyway, what I'm saying is just be attuned to the fact that NIDA, NIMH, I mean, those, those are agencies that are beginning to recognize the need for equity research. And it may not be as difficult as one might think, but it also is to start small. Because if you, if you see my, I've been doing this a really long time. And so when I started, funding was not as crazy as funding is now. But I'm telling you, there's a shift in the way that the federal government is looking at issues of health. If you think about President Biden's recent executive order, we talked about advancing health equity to underserved populations. The legislator then has to appropriate funds for those kinds of settings. So, so anyway, I, I'll stop. Yes, Ken. 
Well, well you're, you're supposed to be now. Can you tell me? Please. Jen was telling who can ask me. <laughs> yeah, Ken. Um, thank you. That was terrific. Um, is there a normal age of child to receive your intervention? We, we say that middle child, middle school age, 9, 10, 11, is the optimal age. And the reason we say that is, we're 10, 10, 11. We say that is, they're, they're, the, they're getting to ready, ready to be in the tweens, such that peers are important, but parents still aren't. So it's like giving them another extra dose of the things that they need in order to navigate these next critical years. Because you know, middle school age is also a critical age for a lot of kids, and particularly black boys that's related to education. So, right. and, and so, so it's um, and so that's the, that's the age, and so the and so the kids are recruited when they're ten. They're exposed to the program when they're eleven. And then they go through a six-week program, and then after that, there's no more boosters. There's nothing else that they receive. We just follow them over time. And it has long sustainability effects uh, five years after the intervention, when they're into middle, I mean, early adulthood. Yes. Yeah. The person behind you, and then you. <laughs> I'm going to get myself in trouble now. Thank uh -oh. you for a wonderful talk. I have a question that I ask many places. I don't know if you'll have a specific answer, but we'll see what you have. Um, I work with Dr. McCoy on the um, the school uh, work that you mentioned, trying to help teachers understand how to how to relate um, with students better, how to understand what they're bringing in in terms of their experiences of adversity, their experiences of racism, their culture, and what we are seeing so much of is. The pushback. So pushback from teachers. Well, pushback not from teachers, from school systems, no, from school no, boards, no. from school. Yeah. So we've had districts that we've been kicked out of because we say systemic racism when we walk in the door. We have schools who have been said, "Don't separate your data by race in terms of your discipline because we don't want to see the disparity." So we're trying to figure out how to walk the line of, "I need to be in this." I need to work with these teachers. They want us there. The administration wants us there. And so how can I take that where it's not in my fly so it doesn't say systemic racism and they don't kick me out? But then, oh my gosh, now I'm part of the problem because I'm not saying systemic racism and it's the problem. I, I, I just, anything you can have to say about that. You know, <laughs> and I'll tell you what I thought about. Well, parents have the parents as advocates to require and request and push. Uh -huh. And what I thought about was, and this was on national news, where uh, the county where I live, where these parents were hassling folks about uh, books and something else, and this one one person at the parent-teacher meeting followed another parent home that's going to just fight the parent. So, so parents are powerful forces. So the question is, how do you begin to organize them to demand? The things that it is that they would like to see happen, because that's what's happening in a lot of the counties in Tennessee, where the parents are saying, we don't want you to remove these books, and we're not going to allow you to remove these books. So that's where the power lies, in the, in the families or the parents requesting what it is that they want. If a difficult time. I talked about this, I think, this morning. It's a, it's, I think I talked about this this morning. It's a difficult time to be doing the kind of work that we do, um, particularly when we're in states where they don't want us to do this kind of work. Um, but it's, it, it's going to create the level of innovative research that we have not experienced before as scientists. And it's thinking outside of the box of how to do what it is that we want to do, uh, that we need to do, because these are critical issues and people are suffering. And we're raising an uneducated group of young people. Um, but so I, so that would be having parents. It's a beautiful answer. Yeah. 
I don't know that it'll work, but that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You and then. Uh, yeah, two questions. Um, so the first one would be like how, in terms of stigma, um, is that more common in the, like the rural area compared to like an urban area where people basically live in the apartments with strangers, like? Is, is stigma more common in rural communities than yeah. stigma about mental illness or mental health? No, that is a cultural, that's a passed down message uh, in a lot of, of African-American communities that when you lose your mind, that you don't want people to know that you've lost your mind. And so people are still use it, using the term, this person is crazy. And, and during the time that, I mean, so, so no, it's not, it is part of the way in which people have thought about what, what it means to be mentally to have a mental or behavioral problem. So no, it's not a it's not a con geographic context context issue. Yeah, my another question would relate to the like a human capital accumulation process. I guess the follow up question will be in terms of the the age for intervention. How does have you like is there any intersection for your, your research to rest of literature on human capital development? Like how does like for example, on what specific age will the intervention will be most beneficial in terms of to basically help those children to retrieve maximum maximize amount of the human capital? Yes, so what is the critical age? Yeah. It's, it's what I mentioned to Ken earlier. We think that and, and so for the for the strong African American family study, we follow those young people from ages ten to twenty six. And with, with sustaining effects, even when they were 26, such that kids that were exposed to the program, life looked a lot different in terms of positive outcomes, finishing school, doing well in terms of employment compared to kids in the uh, control group. And so there, there's, it's the solidification of those protective processes during middle childhood before they go out into a wider audience where the increased subjectivity to racism is going to increase. And that's when you find a lot of what I mentioned to Aria Crump at night of this crossover effect in terms of increased substance use among black kids. So the substance use among black kids began to increase at a time when white kids are, are beginning to decrease. And so there's this critical window, like 23, 24, when it happens, but when you think about what's happening to them, they many of them have been removed from their protective community, and they're out in a place in a space where they're subjected to lots of really bad things, including high rates of unemployment and marginalization. And so, if they have been protected during those earlier years, it increases the likelihood that they can navigate. Again, I'm going back to this rubber suit. Their rubber suit is thick enough to wade wade through the toxic waters. Sure. Yeah. I and you can't ask another question because somebody else. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to you. He's on the road. I'll come back to you. I promise. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thinking about your program and the positive impact it had on the family, um, I'm really interested to kind of go on with what you said. Uh, you know, thinking about our teachers. Uh, there's lots of limitations in terms of teacher education programs and the limitations of teachers need to focus on literacy and mathematics, but they're pushing cultural responses um, with their programs as well and trying to embed that into the curriculum. Um, so I'm wondering if you would thought about what it would look like for your program um, to have a component, uh, look at uh, teacher training uh, and trying to make sure that they are educated about uh, science fantasy as well. So um, the fabulous question. So several years ago, uh, I wrote an R21 with a colleague of mine, a psychiatrist who oversees the counselors for Davidson County, which is Nashville Public School. And so what we wanted to do was to see whether or not it mattered if teachers delivered this program versus community people, because the program is community. Uh, is implemented by community people who we hire and train uh, to do the work. We don't work with public school. So, um, and so the design was to have 
same race match, two black, two white, and then a cross race match to deliver the program. And so the question would be, does that matter? Does race matching matter uh, in terms? And so in, to, in order to prepare the teachers for the engagement, because we talk a lot about uh, black pride and they have to do this creed. We are the best black families in the world. They say this in units, I said it every session. So we wanted to see if we could increase the sense of cultural humility and training for teachers. That was part of the component. Of the, and so they would go through this pre-training before they would deliver the intervention. And then we would look at you know, the fidelity of the program implementation. But it didn't get fun. <laughs> so, but we, we've thought about that. And, and one of the ways, it's again, it's a system. It's a system level change. So if we want to change the classroom environment, such that these kids, every kid feels that they are being raised in a humane and just environment in school that creates learning and inquisitiveness, then the teachers play a major role in that. But if you're looking at these kids once they leave third grade and you view them as a threat, the interaction is going to be very different. So how do we create the sense of humility uh, in the way that teachers began to love all of all children as we should all love all children? So, uh, but there's a project I'd love to talk to you more about. Yeah. Then I'm going to come back to you, I promise you. Have you forgotten your question? After he does. You know, are people asking questions on here? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, do your data speak to the under over identification of children for social and emotional behavior problems at all? I'm asking this from the perspective of an education researcher knowing we're going to be hot. So you, you said, said over emotional. Over identification of emotional or behavior. We you do. Did. Yes, yes, we did. Do those we data actually data? have um, one, one of our studies, studies, we actually have a diagnostic to this. this. Yeah. Is there, are you seeing patterns in which teachers are identifying uh, children for services when the families are saying, no, this behavior is perfectly normal? We have looked at that, that for this particular study, but we have one that I just said, which is that teachers are saying they have problems. They were referring to child parents, and they act like not the child. You know, they're not children, you know, the kids. And so it's minimizing that. I think it's a big opportunity. Meaning that we bought on the journey at a really different time, finally getting to the end. And if parents can realize you can move your child to a much healthier place quicker by having access to the services or taking advantage of the services, but it's really a, an educational opportunity for them that are working families in this referral. There are lots of hands going on now. You have to wait a long time. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I'm just giving you a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I'm thinking a little bit about, you're talking about moving upstream and the public helps, you know, to really think about moving the needle for communities and populations, you know, ultimately you have to get to replication and scale. So I wondered um, if you've given thought or if there are any steps in the work around taking a program. There seems like a lot of promise for scale with a program like this um, that is, you know, computer-based, that where it appears that having a facilitator isn't a requirement, and in some cases you get better outcomes. Have you given thought to scale and doing this in the entire state of Tennessee, and what sorts of challenges you might anticipate as you move outside of a traditional research study with families that are consenting to do this and moving to a whole universe um, of where you're trying to get a parent and a child to both buy in? I think it. I, I I really love that idea. I think I've been so busy trying to figure out what to do, how to begin to prepare for scaling. Because one of the ways to increase scalability is to have it to where it's accessible through the internet. This is on laptop computer, and the reason it wasn't internet uh, developed, you can only guess why. It was a rural community. They don't have broadband. 
So that's why. And so what I what needs to happen, which I keep you know, trying to figure out how to get it funded, but it needs to be transported now for web based delivery. So that it could be easily accessed and you don't have to have the laptop computers and the you know, to be able to, to run the program. Um, but even in its current state, uh, I'm working now with a church in Philadelphia that wants to test this uh, and deliver it to hundreds of families that they have access to in their church. The strong African-American family is already disseminated. It's in lots and lots and lots of places uh, throughout the U.S., schools, juvenile justice systems. Uh, but this would be a great program also for our, the judge Callaway, whom I work with, to have it offered as a program for for kids that are about to be justice involved. Yeah, great. Uh, someone back here. Well, I was going to ask, I grew up in Tennessee. Um, I'm originally from Memphis. Oh, I'm from Jackson. Oh, okay. <laughs> and also, um, I went to college in Nashville, Tennessee. I went to State University. You going to where? Fifth. Fifth, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was just curious to know, like in your research, what particular counties did you look at? Because my father grew up in a rural county in West Tennessee, outside of Memphis, Mississippi County, and I was just curious. Tipton. Tipton, okay. We <laughs> were in Tipton, uh, Haywood, uh, Madison, Hardeman, and Lauderdale. Oh, awesome. Okay. I'll All the counties that you know. Yes. I'll and I have a project there now. Really? In those counties now. Yeah, we're recruiting. So I may need to call your name. <laughs> and I was curious if I'm in this, um, it borders like Mississippi and Arkansas. Yeah. And because of the governor shutting down like, a lot of resources, a lot of rural communities were relying on this to like, come and get resources. And it's Really good to hear your work. And if you do need help, I, you know, there's like a lot of services in there. We'll talk at the same time. But those are the counties, too, that have lost hospitals. And Jackson, Tennessee, which is maybe 80 miles from Tipton County, um, they used to have four hospitals. They now have one. And so all of these counties are coming there. And COVID, when COVID happened, they were setting up tents all over the place. It's, it's dying in terms of health care in these little communities. Okay. The person behind Lynn and then Lynn. And then the person over here. Yes. I keep coming back to your point about disrupting in an extreme way. Can you project? Keep <laughs> coming back to your point of disrupting um, upstream these social health, particularly very health care. And having this unique position where you're in, where you're doing a first role, I'm wondering if any of your work has spoken to the implications of family and having families interact in a virtual versus having to worry about your cousin if it's going to run into. So I'm wondering if what that talk around stigma between the family and it come up, or if maybe what is the opposite way because we're, we're, we're not addressing it, right? We're giving people a big space, but it's you just gave me a fabulous idea. For a <laughs> you know, I'm I'm not a qualitative researcher, so this work was done with my colleague at Vanderbilt that does qualitative research. But what one of the things that I thought about, and I'm just going to give my idea out because it doesn't matter. <laughs> one of the things that I was thinking about, once this program is in a virtual space, to be able to set up these chat rooms with a staff person that facilitates. It's a great opportunity to do exactly what you said, because the piece that's missing. So one of the things that I didn't bring out in terms of the differential programmatic effects by platform is in the small group, we saw the greatest changes in parents in the small group on issues of general parenting, just monitoring, talking to your kids about friends and clothes and all of that. But topics that were sensitive, puberty, sex, drugs, racism, parents in the technology group demonstrated the greatest change. So what it says to me is that both settings are needed 
that the parents need to talk to other parents to normalize what's going on with my child that's 11 and doesn't take baths. And someone says, mine doesn't either. So there's something that normalizes the general parenting processes for parents. But to be able to practice talking about these sensitive topics with an avatar, because they can interact with these avatars. They get reinforced or not as a consequence of the interaction. And you're able to do it without anybody knowing what you said and how you said it. Uh, the things that you've been thinking about, uh, your avatar is not going to tell it to anybody. So it's a safe place for those kinds of topics. So I think it needs both. And what you just said was a, is a great way to begin to think about ex escalating the use of technology. And I will tell you, I really don't want to do any more small groups. And the for, reason for that is fidelity is not an issue. You don't have to get caterers to bring food and buses to pick up people and child care and people don't show up and you order food for 15 families and you have one and they take all the food home for church services the next day. Uh, so, yeah, let me answer let you ask your question. Oh, Lynn, you're next. <laughs> okay. I forgot. Okay. Well, I love listening to you. I see. I see. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, most of us in research think little. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, and um, I, you're doing RCT, too, and I, I'm kind of, as I've gotten really old, I'm tired of it. <laughs> you're tired? <laughs> you're tired of RCT. <laughs> and I can see that you're moving big. And I, you are one of the few people that have been able to do it. And I just wondered, have you written anything about how you've done it? I find it extremely difficult to go, to move up. And there's not a lot written about how do you do that successfully and who's going to help fund it. Yeah. And you obviously have been doing this for a while. So do you have any thoughts? <laughs> Sounds like Lynn is getting ready to interview me right now. Uh, you know, I haven't, that's a great question, Lynn, because I haven't really thought about it. And I don't think about the bigness. I just think about doing the work. And, and I'm just, and I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate and I appreciate having worked with really great colleagues uh, along the way. And, uh, and, and, you know, this this whole idea about this technology, moving this family-based preventive intervention and technology emerged, I don't know if Lynn has heard the story or not, when it was time for the competing continuation for this grant, I visited my youngest sister, and at the time her son was 13, but he was almost 60, and his dad is 62, 63. And these two men were running around the kitchen, grunting at each other. I mean, it was like... What is this? And when when I went to the room where I was sleeping, the two of them were playing basketball when uh, Alan Iverson was a superstar. So that dates my nephew. Um, they were sitting at the at the computer at the whatever the screen is. This big six foot kid leaning over on his dad, and they're playing these games, and they each have their characters, and then. They got quiet, and then Larry says, so what happened to you and Jamal the other day? And I said, ah, so he's talking. Now they're talking in a wonderful father-son interaction. And I said, wow, what if I could deliver a family-based preventive intervention via technology so people are interacting with these things and does it facilitate greater interaction in families? And that's what drove this idea. And I called my program officer at NIMH, and Pim said, it's too far out there, <laughs> NIH, NIMH will never fund this. Uh, and I said, well, I'm willing to try to see if these families like it. And so I started working with these um, 
computer programmers and we be create create the first template and the families loved it. And these wool things. Yeah. So that's that's how it started. But it's really thinking about where families are and how do you get how do you create situations where well, one you tell their story in a way that it's reflective of their lived experiences that's not deficit. And then how do you begin to create ways that your work can facilitate positive change? And that's really all that drives me. I don't I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, in terms of thinking big from the research space to the policy making space, not only the research pointed out the discussions of barriers to care or insurance covers those at the bottom mm -hmm. but Policymakers are quick to focus on like interest mm -hmm. like, and mm -hmm. on the more resident and focus on these social insurance issues. So, how does one kind of push the needle in terms of the policy making and getting policymakers to focus on upstream? <laughs> That's a that's a great question. So I'm part of this child health policy group at Vanderbilt. And we and I think I mentioned this to Jen, we do a survey every year uh to ask families critical questions about what are you concerned with and why and what do you need in order to be able to address these concerns. And so we and they and we're meeting on a Friday. And what we do then, we take the poll data and we work with the team to develop the message. And so the message last last week was about the last the message coming up this week is about mental health, the mental health needs of kids, and ways in which they wish that they had greater access to it in school. Is what the parents said. And so we then get together and we write so we. Develop the graphics for this. It's posted and all kind of child health clinics who part of the listserv. We have the tele, we have a television person, local TV person that comes to Vanderbilt. She interviews the team and she'll interview some parents. Then she'll go up on the hill and she'll say, this is what the parents are going to be saying. So can I get someone as a representative to respond to this? And so we, it's pushing it, pushing it right in their face. Uh, and, and so, and it's all around social media and we'll say there's a bill, we'll link the bill to that particular issue so that people can read that there's a bill that's coming down the pipeline that's focusing on this particular issue. And so that's one way that we've been able to push, you know, push this topic, uh, or push issues, critical issues in the policy level. And then when you ride behind a legislator where you've got this picture of this really cute kid that says, I'm afraid to go to school because of gun violence, which is what we're going to talk about in two weeks. <laughs> and then you've got the percentages of parents in crossing the state, rural and urban, that's concerned about this. And then you ask the legislators, say, this was just published by Vanderbilt University Medical Center about the concerns that parents have about child uh, violence in school, kids getting shot. And so talk to us about it. So, so that, I mean, that, that's one of the ways that we've been able to push. Push the envelope, uh, which I think we should do more of that. Uh, and we wait until our work is published because we don't want anybody to know what's in it before we get it out. But by the time it gets out, the bill has passed. And I just think we need to think creatively about how do we push our work to where we begin to influence these upstream things because they're not going to read our papers. If, you know, I'm sorry. I don't care if what if it's in Lansing. I don't care what it is. They're not reading our papers. Okay. okay. I'm gonna have to jump in here okay. because I know I have a lot of questions, and <laughs> really everyone else. Oh, there's so, the but there's a reception. So the good news is that we can move the conversation downstairs, and you can keep discussing over um, food in the main lobby downstairs. Um, yeah. In the meantime, I want to thank you so much for sharing your. a conversation downstairs. Thank you also again to the Salzberger family for your support. Thank you. 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 Thank you.